John chapter 8, for a, a few weeks now, we've been on this subject of becoming a disciple of Jesus. Becoming a disciple of Jesus. John 8, 31 and 32 has been our main text. John 8, 31 says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, you, you've heard this 32nd verse quoted probably many times, but perhaps by itself. But can you see that it goes with the 31st verse? These two go together. So when you're saying, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, uh, we should ask the question, who? Who shall know the truth? Verse 31 asks, a, uh, answers the question. Look at verse 31 again. What does it say? He said to those Jews that what? <laughs> so these are believers. They believe on him. He said, if, that next word though is if, you continue in my word, then are you my, my disciples indeed. So does it make you a disciple automatically if you're a believer? No. Obviously not. Apparently not. Because these people believed on him. And then he says, if you continue in my word, then you'll be my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Who's going to be made free? Now see, a lot of people have just taken that word know. You'll know the truth. And, and they think it's about accumulation of knowledge. That if I know enough, I'll be free. This is not true. I know some years ago, I was in a, uh, a conference uh, of faith people like myself, excited to be there, just looking around before the services began. And uh, the Lord spoke to my heart. I don't mean to hurt an audible voice, but inside me, he said, son, there's a misconception in your circles, a misconception. I thought, Lord, what is it? And I know when he says in your circles, I know he's talking about people that call himself word people and faith people and that kind of thing. I said, what is it, Lord? And again, I don't mean I heard a voice, but inside me I knew what the Lord was communicating to me. He said, it's this, that if you'll, quote, get in the word enough, it'll solve all your problems and troubles. I said, yeah, we pretty much believe that. <laughs> Right, that if you'll get in the Word enough, it'll solve all your problems. He said, wrong. He said, it's only the doer of the Word that gets results. And man, I, I've been getting revelation off of that for years now, ever since he said that. You just keep seeing other parts of it. It's not the person that goes to every service that gets free. It's not the person that has a closet full of a tape series or a shelf full of notes. It's not a person, the person who has a head full of knowledge. You can know all kind of things and be just as bound as you were 20 years ago. Right? It's not how much you know. And this, what he's talking about here, a disciple is not just a learner. A disciple is a follower, a doer. He said, if you continue in my word, and if you put that with other scriptures, you can see he's talking about living in the word, being a doer of the word. If you continue in my word, then you'll, you'll know the truth. That word also means experience. Experience. You'll experience the truth. And when, when you do it, when you experience the truth, what follows? 
freedom, liberty. When you experience truth in your life, you are being set free while you're experiencing the truth. So much you don't, you don't experience through books. Hmm? You have to do it. I mean, you can read books on sailing. You can take online courses on sailing. But when you get out there, right, and you unfurl the sail, and the wind and the salt water hit you, experience is a different thing. I know a few years ago, I began to learn how to fly faster airplanes and very first jet type rating. And uh, we're in school, they, they wouldn't even let you in the simulator for days and days and days. Just class, 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 numbers, 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 class, class, class. Books, I mean books this tall, books, books. And then you get in the, the simulator, which is exactly like the plane. In fact, you know, uh, five minutes after you're in there, you forget it's a simulator. Uh, grown men have been known to scream. <laughs> it's real. And uh, <laughs> you, you begin to do it, and old oh, man, you start going, what'd they say? What was in the book? You know? I missed that by doing and then the next time you get back in the class, you're paying more attention. You're thinking, man, I got to, I got to get this, right? Because you know you're gonna have to do it. Is there a difference between knowing and doing? Hmm? Well, in the Christian life and the Christian walk, there is a tremendous gap and difference between knowing and doing. Who gets miracles? Only the doers, only. Their people can quote half the Bible and they've got the same problem they had 20 years ago. There's people who's been to everybody in their brother's conference and meeting and, and got two closets full of tape series and, and a, ha a whole wall full of notes and still just as bound and just as weak in certain areas of their life as they were 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Why? You know, it doesn't take that long for the word to grow you up and produce results in your life. We should be seeing major changes in people's lives in two years, three years. Did you hear me? When people are bumping along for 10 years, 15 years, and they're just as big a baby as they were, just as weak as they were 15 years ago, it's because they're not doing it. It's not ignorance. It's not that they need to learn more. They're not doing what they know. Whether it's me, you, whoever it is. We're supposed to be changing rapidly. Every time we have a service, we're not supposed to just be hearing new revelation. We're supposed to be saying, what do I do with this? <laughs> Everything you hear, you're supposed to be saying, how does this change my life? What do I stop? What do I start? What do I change? If you're not doing that with everything you hear, then you can become a hearer only. And you can go year after year. Years can turn into decades. And you can still be scratching your head while you're not getting results. Tell me who gets results. The only. <laughs> only. The doers of the word. They're the only ones. Not the hallelujahers, not, not, not the shouters, not, 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 not the CD buyers. Come on now. Who, who gets results? Me, you, whoever we're talking about. Only, only the doers. Do I have any doers in here? Amen. How many know you, you should only talk about tithing and giving so long and then you should what? <laughs> Tithe. Give. You should only talk about walking in love so long and then you should walk in love. You only should talk about faith so much and then you should actually live by faith. Amen. Have some faith. Amen. Right? Amen. Do it. Do it. Do it. Well, he said, if you continue in my word, you'll be my disciples indeed. You'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Go to Luke, please, the sixth chapter, and we'll see the reason why 
we'd become, we're to become disciples. Luke 6.40 says, the disciple, the who? Disciple. Not, not believer now. There's a difference between believers and disciples. The disciple has made a greater commitment than the believer. The disciple has subjected and submitted their life to the Lord beyond the believer. The disciple is not above his master. Now, you know, a lot of people will think that's an unnecessary statement. Of course, the master said it, so it must be necessary. But people would say, oh, I, uh, uh, man, I, you wouldn't have to tell me that, that, that I'd never be above my master. That's just ridiculous to even to bring it up. He brought it up. It's not ridiculous. The, the many, many sides to this. One of them is this. There are a lot of people are trying to get the results that Jesus got, but they're not willing to live like he lived. <laughs> hmm? Try, they're wanting to see the results that he had in his life, but they're not willing to live clean like he lived. They're not willing to walk in faith like he walked in faith. Not willing to pray like he prayed. Did you hear me? Yeah. Well, the servant's not above his master. If Jesus had to keep his body under, you're going to have to keep yours under. Right? right? If, if he had to commune with the Father, if he had to walk by faith, if he had to not yield to fear, whatever he had to do, we'll have to do. We're not above him. We'll have to do it like he did it. He said, but everyone that is perfect shall be what? As his master. Now, this is, this is why we're talking about this. This is why there is such a thing as being a disciple of the Lord. What's the ultimate goal? To become just like him. When? Can we become like him now? Here? In this life? In this world? Millions do not believe that. Millions of church-going people do not believe it's possible to become uh, appreciably like the Lord. Maybe a little bit, but basically we're old sinners saved by grace, and you're not going to make it through a day without sinning, and Jesus never sinned, so there you are. He's here. You're here. When you get to heaven, maybe, you become like Jesus. So millions don't even believe it's possible. But then there are a few that believe it's possible. Hmm? But among them, many of them don't, are, are not willing to pay the price. They believe it's possible, but they're unwilling to do what it takes to be a disciple. Because it costs a lot. I said it costs a lot. Now, we've covered a lot of ground already in talking about the cost of discipleship. And you ought to, you ought to go over to uh, uh, Luke, the 14th chapter, while you're there. Luke 14, we've already covered this, but I want us to remind ourselves again. Here is the cost of discipleship. Luke 15, 26, who's talking? Jesus. He said, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. He can't be my disciple. He went on talking about, he said, for which of you well, excuse me, verse 27. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, he what? <laughs> Cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sits not down first and counts the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? And he goes on talking about counting the cost, counting the cost. Verse 33. 33, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsakes not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Now, you know Jesus is not negative. Right? 
And yet here three times in a handful of verses, he says, you can't be my disciple. You can't be my disciple. You can't be unless you do this, unless you're willing to do this. This is serious business, isn't it? Is it going to cost you to be his disciple? How much? Everything. Everything. You can't, you can't let father or mother or wife or child stand in your way of being his disciple and following him. You can't let any of your own aspirations or dreams or ideas stand in the way. Right? When you become his disciple, your life is no longer your own. Now, people say, well, yeah, if, man, if I saw, just completely sold out to follow the Lord like that, I'd, I, I wouldn't have a life. Exactly. <laughs> I'd lose my own identity. Precisely. <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> and you got people, Christians. Not making this up more than once. People left their spouse, left their kids, left home, launched out into who knows where to try to find their self. Well, the Bible says you're dead. You're dead. We found you. We can save you a trip. <laughs> we found you and you're dead. So you can just forget about all your little plans and your stuff and your aspirations and who you want to be and all this kind of stuff. If you're his disciple, he is the master. You're no longer making your own decisions. Your whole life is based on what he says. Day to day, what he wants. And if you're smart, you won't make a whole bunch of plans and dreams that you have to die to anyway. Now, we saw this uh, already in studying that the Bible compares walking with the Lord to being like a top athlete or being like a, a, a soldier, a special forces soldier. Listen to this as I read it in 1 Corinthians 9. Don't turn there. But 1 Corinthians 9, in the Living Bible, it says, In a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets a prize. So run your race to win. To win the contest, you must deny yourselves many things that would keep you from doing your best. An athlete goes to all this trouble just to win a blue ribbon or a silver cup, but we do it for a heavenly reward that never disappears. Thank you, Lord. The English version says, every athlete in training submits to strict discipline. Now, what's that got to do with our walk with the Lord? Do most Christians think they get up on Monday morning? Do they think, okay, I'm in training. I got to train today spiritually like, a, like an Olympic athlete. This is almost a foreign concept. Because people think, well, I believe in Jesus. And I, I come to church. Ain't that about it? <laughs> no. That ain't about it. <laughs> There's something else. If you'll take the step to become a disciple. We, we have examples of this concept all through our culture and history, old and new. We've talked about it before, but the old, you know, from the Orient, martial arts training. You've got the, the master, the teacher, and you've got the learner. You know, the old show Kung Fu. There was the old master and there was the grasshopper, right? Yeah. Newer uh, version is like Star Wars. So you got the uh, Jedi master and you got the Padawan learner. Well, what are they trailing along? They're not just uh, trying to accumulate knowledge in their head. What are they doing? They are learning how to be like the master. And they're learning by precept and by example. Well, friend, we're not looking for a Jedi master. We have found the master, the master, the master. And it's up to us if we're willing to become his disciple. 
It's a 24-7 deal. It's all your lifetime long. And if he really is your master, it's going to cost you in this life and in this place. You have, to, you have to get to the place where you just, you let it go. You turn loose of it and you follow him. The first disciples, you remember how he called them. He'd point to them, you know, the fisherman, the tax collector. He'd say, follow me. And what they do, they got up, they left everything, didn't they? They walked away. They followed him. Well, he still has disciples today. And it's up to you whether you want to be a believer and just warm the pew till he comes or you want to be a disciple. What's happening with the disciple? They are becoming like him. Listen to this in, uh, in Ephesians. Uh, don't turn there, but just listen to him. Put it up on the screen for me, please, guys. Uh, Ephesians... One moment, please. 4, 13 in the Amplified. Ephesians 4, 13 in the Amplified says this, that it might develop until we all attain oneness in the faith and in the comprehension of the full and accurate knowledge of the Son of God that we might arrive at really mature manhood the completeness of personality, which is nothing less than the standard height of Christ's own perfection, the measure of the stature of the fullness of the Christ and the completeness found in him. That's being just like him, right? Is it possible to grow up until you develop fully like him? The, the devil will tell you no. The devil will tell you, no way, that's Jesus. You're never going to come close to that. But Jesus tells you different. Yes. He said the disciple, when he's fully trained, will be just like the master. Hallelujah. Jesus said it. Red letters. <laughs> you believe the Bible, don't you? Yes. Listen, Romans 8, 29. Romans 8, 29 says, whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to what? Amen. To the image of his son, is it your destiny yes. to be conformed to his exact image yes. and likeness, to become just like him? Yes. 1 John 3, 2, 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. When? Now. now. 1 John 4, 17. 1 John 4, 17 says, Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because, read it with me, as he is, so are we. Where? Where? Here. When are we to become like him? Now. Here. Now. Should you be much more like him now than you were last year this time? Should you be? Yes, you should. But now, if that is to happen, it's going to cost you something. It means you've got to change. Do, you know, how much do you think you're like Jesus right now? Ninety percent like Jesus? Fifty percent? Thirty percent like Jesus? Well, whatever the case might be, if you think you're two and a half percent like Jesus, that means there's 97 and a half percent got to change. Got to change. So much has got to change. Look at your neighbor and tell them, say, uh, you need to change. <laughs> say, <laughs> you, you need to change. You... You need a lot of change. <laughs> Tell them that. Say, you need a lot, lot of change. Lot of change. <laughs> now you look back and you say, I know it. I, uh, good 
teachers, good masters, are going to correct you. Aren't they? They're going to correct you. I know I, my dad put me in a school of martial arts when I was 10. And I was in it for years after that. And uh, old school, concrete floors and no pads. Man, it did me a lot of good, though. I'm telling you, I'm not, I'm not joking. It did me a world of good. And the instructor would teach you and, and tell you what to do, and you're going through your forms and your motions and all that kind of stuff. And if you didn't uh, heed the correction uh, the first time or two or three, the next thing you'd feel would be a foot. <laughs> and you'd be put out on the floor. Boom! And you're supposed to pop up and say, Thank you, sir! Let me know if you're training for the Olympics, if you're training to be a runner, if you're training to f gymnastics. We just saw the Olympics in, in China. How many know good coaches are not the ones who sit on the bench and eat tater chips and go, oh, that's fine. Yeah, honey, go ahead. That's, oh, that's good. <laughs> the good ones are going to hold you to a standard. Is that right? And if your performance is substandard, it's going to be unacceptable to them. Yeah, right. They're not going to tell you it's okay. They're going to tell you it's not okay. Yes. And sometimes you get tired of hearing 103 times in a row <laughs> that it's substandard <laughs> and not okay. That's right. Amen. Yeah. But if you're a good athlete or if you're a good soldier... You'll take that instruction the 104th time and say, thank you for pointing it out to me. I will get it. I'll get it. I'm after it. And we live in a generation of Christians and believers that are unwilling to receive correction. Oh, no. No, they will receive compliments. <laughs> huh? They'll receive instruction if it's in the right tone. <laughs> and if they want to. But correction? Uh-uh. Rebuke? Absolutely not. If you will not receive correction, you cannot be his disciple. Just that simple. Just that simple. I know looking back over the course of Phyllis in my life, we were talking about the other day, even in secular jobs, in fact, we wound up with some rough bosses. Man. <laughs> I mean, I worked for a guy. He had, uh, he had slapped people and kick his dog off the porch just to get started in the morning. I'm, so, I'm not making it up. Mean. And Phyllis had some folks she worked with, and, and we, and as time went on and, and things progressed, that some people that were very, very, uh, you know, demanding in some ways. And some of that stuff, of course, is not right. That meanness is not right. But if you can't take some hardness, I mean, remember what the Bible said, endure hardness as a good soldier then you can't be a disciple of the Lord. You, you got to be willing to train. And it's, uh, it's amazing. You know, people, you try to correct them as pastors or as leaders, you try to correct them. And people look shocked like, are you correcting me? Are you correcting me? And you want to say, do you think you don't need any? You think you have arrived at Christ-like perfection? Everybody, everybody needs correction. Why? You're not completely like him yet. Well, you do have to love me the way I am. Said who? Well, you do, you know. Jesus preached love and acceptance. Says who? No, he didn't. No, he didn't. He preached repentance and the kingdom of God. Don't let, don't let sinners tell you what Jesus preached. A 
again and again. You hear people talk about, well, now Jesus preached love and acceptance. Why are they even bring it up? They don't know him. They're not serving him. They're just trying to uh, make you accept their sin. You have to accept my sin. No, we absolutely do not have to accept your sin. No, we don't. Well, but you have to accept me the way I am. No, we do not. But Jesus does. No, he loves you. You're accepted in the beloved because of your faith. He does not accept all of your goofy ways. <laughs> he does not accept, and we don't have to accept all of your ungodly, unchristlike junk. Amen. And if you love me, you have to love it. No, 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 we don't. We're not going to. <laughs> and you shouldn't accept you the way you are either. We need to change. I said we need, all of us need to change. We need to change, every day we need to change. If that's true, you gotta be getting some correction, some instruction, some reproof. You gotta be being shown, this is not right. This is not like him. This has gotta change. This is not right. And, and you gotta keep saying, okay, thank you. All right, I receive it. Okay, you're right, I gotta change. You're right. And if you're unwilling to do that, you cannot be his disciple. Go with me to 1 Peter, please. There's two words you need to know about becoming a disciple. They're completely unpopular. <laughs> Politically and religiously incorrect. But when has that stopped us before? 1 Peter 5. Do you think it's necessary for you to change? Yes. Do you think in order for that to happen, you've got to receive correction? Yes. Hmm? Yes. If you're not right about everything, what does that mean? It means you're wrong about some stuff. <laughs> about some stuff you think and the ways you see and the ways you're doing things, that needs to be corrected, doesn't it? And And... If the Father loves you, what does He do? He corrects you, right? He loves you. If people love you, what are they going to do? They're going to correct you. So why does it have to, why do you have to take it as a hurtful thing and become offended? You should realize God's loving me. He's helping me. He's not leaving me, you know, unchristlike. He's helping me. First Peter, the fifth chapter. And the 10th verse, he said, but the God of all grace, that's how you're going to take all the correction. <laughs> that's how you're going to make it through. <laughs> I've had people look at me and just go, well, I'm tired of being wrong all the time. <laughs> well, honey, if you're wrong, you're wrong. I don't care how tired you get of being wrong. If you're wrong, you're still wrong. <laughs> well, if you think I needed to change so much, why did you hire me to begin with? Well, why did Jesus take you to begin with? He knew how much he's going to need to change. Me and you both. <laughs> Look at your neighbor again. Help him out and say, you need to change. You, you, you need a lot of change. You need a lot of, lot of change. <laughs> either that, either, either you do or you're sitting here having arrived at Christ-like perfection and everything you think, say, and do is just like him. Well, what's the alternative again? You need to change. That's what I'm going to go with. You need to change. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> this change is not always comfortable. In fact, it is often uncomfortable. You know why everybody's, not everyone is an Olympic athlete? Because it is uncomfortable training like that. It takes discipline, man. 
You got to discipline yourself when you get up, when you go to bed, what you eat, when you eat, how you train. And again and again, you do not want to do it. Your, bed, your body, body does not want to roll out of the bed again at 5 o'clock in the morning and run three miles or 5 or 10 or whatever it might be, but you do it. It involves suffering. That's one of the words. <laughs> Suffering. 1 Peter 5, 10. But the God of all grace, who's called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you what? That's the word we saw in Luke 6, 40. The disciples not above his master, but everyone that is perfect, don't let that word throw you, it means fully developed. Fully trained, fully developed, we saw in other translations. Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Somebody say suffering. suffering. Is there a suffering according to the will of God? Yes. This is not something you hear as much in faith circles. People like to think, oh, no. Now, Brother Keith, we've been redeemed from suffering. No, no. No suffering, no suffering at all. In fact, we're on a campaign to stamp out suffering. No, <laughs> we're making t-shirts, no suffering. <laughs> well, we have been redeemed from suffering, oppression, depression, torment. We have been redeemed from suffering a life, being in a life of sin and the wages of death from sin. We have been redeemed from suffering sickness and disease. Thank God we can be healed. We've been redeemed from suffering poverty and lack and not getting our bills paid and our needs met. We've been redeemed from all the curse of the law. But there are other kinds of suffering. I said there's other kinds of suffering. The Bible said Jesus, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. suffered. Not talking about suffered being sick or broke or what was this? This was the kind of suffering where he sweat blood. That's suffering. And nobody was there in the flesh hurting him. What was going on? Listen to his prayer. Not my will, but your will be done. This is the other word, submission. If you're going to be his disciple, there will be suffering and there will be submission. And the reason why a lot of folk don't preach on it is because they get the same response I'm getting right now. <laughs> and they're like, Brother Keith, we want to shout. We want to run, say hallelujah. Well, yeah, but do you want a baby, be a baby your whole life? No. You just want to be a, a believer, a pew warmer. No. And after, at the end of your life, hardly be like Jesus at all. This is happening with Christians by the millions. Right? People are dying, going to be with the Lord. They're saved. Yeah, thank God they're saved. But they're not much more like Jesus than they were when they were born again 60 years ago. It's pitiful. It's sad. Because they're unwilling to be a disciple, to be a follower of his, and to let him correct them. Now, this suffering that we're talking about, let me, uh, let me give this example. Brother Hagen, my father in the faith, a lot of you have been influenced strongly by him in heaven now. But he said this. He, he's got a little book that's titled, Must Christians Suffer? Nobody's read it? You only read the faith ones. So. <laughs> faith and Holy Spirit, yeah. He has a book called Must Christians Suffer? Very good. Very good. And in it, he brings this up. I've heard him talk about it personally. He, he said this one time in a, to a crowd. And he said it privately at different times. He said, do you want to know, he said, why I'm settled? 
He'd ask that question. And I worked with the man closely for years and years and years, and he was very settled. Not yo-yo. Not up and down. I mean, every day, comforting, because every day, the same. Same. You didn't have to wonder what kind of mood's Brother Hagin in today. Thank God. Because there's a lot of folk you don't know from morning to afternoon. What's going on with them? How many know that is not like Jesus? He's the same. Jesus is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. The more like him you are, the more you're that way. You're the same. And uh, he was settled. Very settled. I mean, things didn't move him. Settled. And he asked the question, would you like to know why I'm so settled today? And he went on to say, I'm quoting him now. He said, it's because I've suffered. It's because I've suffered. Then he'd go on to describe what it, how he suffered. And he would tell how that uh, every church he pastored in the early days was a troubled church. How that they had splits and divisions and one, side, uh, one group would sit on one side of the church and glare at the other group. And, and they wouldn't get along. It wouldn't work. He said sometimes he'd pray and prepare all week. And he'd get up there and preach his heart out. And it just felt like it was a rubber ball hitting the back of the wall. And just coming back and slapping him in the face. He said hard, hard, hard. And he'd, he'd come back home. He'd tell Miss Aretha when they're laying down to go to bed Sunday night. He said if I didn't know the Lord told us to come here. I'd go get a U-Haul first thing in the morning. Or excuse me, no, that night. <laughs> Is what he said. I'd go get and we'd load up and we'd be gone in the morning. Now, a lot of people not only felt that way, they left. Right? And if you leave because it's hot in the kitchen, if you leave because you're uncomfortable, you will not be perfected. Come on, read that verse again. When are you going to be perfected? After you have suffered a while. After what? <laughs> Do you want to be his disciple? Yes. Now, when you think about this suffering, if you think, oh, well, I guess I could suffer for Jesus. I could. I get you don't qualify. Mm -mm. The Olympic athlete that's training and suffering and putting their body under, do they act pitiful and want you to feel sorry for them? Why? Because to them, the cost is not worth the glory, not worthy to be compared, the Bible says to the glory that shall be revealed. What, what's costing them right now, it's well worth the price they're paying. And they do it willingly. Nobody's making them do it. They do it willingly. They do it gladly. Why? Because what I'm after is worth so much more. We've got to think that way. We've got to feel that way. You can't go, oh, I, I guess, Lord, I'll do it if I have to. And, and Jesus said, if you put your hand to the plow and you do this, oh, I... I guess I could go, but I, he says, you're not worthy. You don't qualify. You got to say, you got to be strong and you got to be willing to endure hardness as a good soldier, right? You got to say, no, no, yeah, yeah, it's a little uncomfortable, but that's all right. Bring it on. Here we go. Because what I'm headed for, what, what's happening in me, the junk is coming out of me. The unlike Christ stuff is coming off of me. I'm changing. Is it all easy? No, no. Looking back over Phyllis in my life, several situations. I'm looking back several times. We could have missed God. We were, we were so close. You know, you ever been mad before? You ever been upset before? Oh, man. There are times in life where you, you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. There have been times I've come and fallen across the bed and put in a request for a transfer. <laughs> I said, Lord, I want to do something else. But now if Jesus is your master, yeah. see, we got, we got 
All these Christians that are just, they, they start jobs when they want to. They quit them when they want to. They go to churches and they change churches when they want to. They just change. They do what they want to when they want to. They change spouses when they want to. They just, you know, they, they, they leave their kids. They, they do whatever they decide that they feel like that they should do that's best for them. Jesus is not their Lord. He is not their master. They are their own master. They are running their life. If Jesus is your master and you're his disciple, no matter what's going on, you have to come to him. You have to ask him, right? And many times he'll say, you know, like I'm putting in a request and it came back denied. (laughs) So now what do you do? Yeah, but I don't want to. Yeah, but yeah, but they're being mean to me. Yeah, but they don't appreciate my gift. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, yeah. Jesus either is your master or he's not. If he's your master, it's settled. It's done. You're staying. Not only are you staying, you're gonna be happy about it. I'm telling you now. This this, this is not optional. It's not just those that are obedient that eat the the good of the land. You got to be willing. You got to stir yourself up. I said this in first service, it'll it'll bear repetition. Years ago, years ago, I was sitting at a signal in my car, waiting for it to change. Got a revelation. Big one. This is it. God is smarter than me. (laughs) Really, he is. You might say, Brother Keith, didn't you know that before? Yeah, but not like. It came to me on a different level. What do you mean? He made me. He knows me better than I know myself. He, He knows Uh, the end from the beginning of my life and call. He knows what I'm graced to do and what I'm not. He knows where I fit and where I don't. He knows. He knows so much better than me. And if I got any smarts, I'm going to trust him. Right? I'm going to let him be Lord. And I'm going to let him be master. I'm going to follow him. And do like the master said concerning himself and the father. He said, I delight to do thy will, O God. Not only will I do it, I what? I delight to do it. If it's your will, I delight in it. Can you do that over your flesh? No matter how you feel or what you thought you wanted or needed, can you do it? Yes, you can. It's an act of your will. It's a choice of your faith. And so I learned at that point as things begin to happen, man, this has helped me out many a time. There'd be things I'm looking at, and I thought, boy, now that's not my call. Uh-uh, that's new. That's not me. And he'd say, I want you to do that. <laughs> Happened to me more than once. And I said, right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, now that you say it, I like it. <laughs> if you like it. Uh, and my head's going, no, no, that's what you say. Shut up, shut up, head. And, and your soul is going, that's not you. That's not you. Because say, shut up. He's smarter than me. If he says this is me, this is me. Who are you? You are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Who are you? You are whoever he says you are. You are whatever and whoever he says you are. If you thought in your mind, oh, that's not me. If he says that's you, that's you, that's you. There's been other times I've looked at things and I thought, oh, man, that, yeah, that's what I want to do. That's, that's the thing. Yes, Lord, I'm leaving you for that. And he said, I don't want you to do that. And I said, right. <laughs> right, now that you say it, I don't even like it. it you don't. And your soul is going, we do like it. You say, shut up, shut up. No, you don't. No, you don't. He's smarter than me. Right? 
say it out loud. I delight, I delight to do your will, will. oh God. Oh God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother Hagin said, you want to know why I'm settled today? He said, it's because I've suffered. Suffered what? They that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You'll suffer some things for obeying him. And one of the big things you'll suffer is like what Jesus, how he learned obedience. He suffered having to submit his will to the Father's will. Was that easy when he's praying there in the garden, sweating blood, saying, not my will? No, that's not easy. It's not easy for him. It's not easy for you. It involves suffering. Not suffering from the curse of the law, but suffering not getting your way. Hmm? And if you're not willing to be corrected, and you're not willing to suffer not getting your way, not getting to do what you want to do at times, then you cannot be his disciple, and you will not be perfected. You'll not be matured. You'll not be settled. You'll not be established. You'll remain a baby. That's why we got a lot of babies in the body. Bless their hearts. The Lord put them in the perfect place for them. And they didn't stay there three months, six months, a year. They jumped out because somebody didn't treat them the way they thought they should have been. And they got embarrassed and their pride and everything. And they've been bouncing around from one place to another, out of the will of God, out of the place. They love the Lord. He loves them. But they will never mature. Yeah, that's right. They will not become like Him because they're unwilling to suffer and submit. No, those athletes roll out of bed. They're stiff, they're sore, they're tired, they're bruised, but there's something drives them. There's something driving them, right? Yeah. Not only do they do it, they enjoy it, yeah. right? Yeah. They push through the pain, they push through the soreness, they find their second win, right? And they shave some off of their time and all their celebration. They're that much closer to the world record, right? And people do this for half their life sometimes to get a gold medal, something that's temporary, something that's fade away. He said, we do it. Do we do it? <laughs> we do it to obtain an incorruptible crown, something that will never fade away. And in the meantime, you're becoming more like Jesus every day. Day until people that hadn't seen you in a while, they look at you and go, man, you're different. You're different. You have changed. And you go, yeah, I needed to change. <laughs> well, you're better. You're improved. I like what you've done with yourself. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 And the ultimate goal is like Jesus. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And we're supposed to be so much like this that people that don't know the Lord at all, when they see us, they hear us, they see how we think, how we live, they've seen the Master. Because we're His disciples. Right? Hallelujah. Stand on your feet, everybody. We trust this message has ministered to you. If you plan to be in the Branson area, please visit us at Faith Life Church, located at 3701 State Highway 76. Services are Friday nights at 7.30 and Sunday mornings at 9 and 11. You can also watch our services online at flcbranson.org. For more information, please call us at 417-334-9233.